from the time of the garden, God released his word that Jesus was coming. And you kept saying it through the prophets. You kept saying it through the psalmists. You kept saying it for hundreds of years. And then there came a time where the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that word is still becoming flesh today. Even tonight, souls are being saved. The word of forgiveness is becoming flesh in, in their hearts. The word of redemption, the word of healing, the word of deliverance, the word of righteousness. We are the very righteousness of God in you, Christ Jesus, tonight. Not because of the works that we've done, not because of the perfection that we have, but because you gave it to us as a gift. You earned it. And you turn around and you gave it to us. And we bless you and we honor you and we thank you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. I texted Brother Bill and Sister Kara about an hour ago, I guess, and they have... They have landed. They have made it. Hallelujah. They, they're here in Tampa now. They're getting settled into the hotel. Go ahead. You getting, uh, they're getting settled into the hotel and wonder what was going on there. <laughs> so uh, it's Friday night at 7 p.m. right here at the church is the Unlocking Glory Conference. And uh, we are very blessed and very honored that uh, Brother Bill and Sister Kara are down here. And we are expecting the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The outpouring of the fire of God. The gifts to be in manifestation. The, the, the word of the Lord to come to pass. On and on and on and on. We are putting our faith into the unexpected. We are expecting the unexpected. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, do we have that video ready to play? Let's go ahead and play one more time that video that they sent us not too long ago. We think we're going to play the video that they sent us not too long ago. Are we there? Hello, Rock Church, Tampa Bay, Florida. It's Bill and Karen Nordine. And we're coming to see you in October, the 22nd through the 24th. Amen. We're so excited about the Unlocking Glory Conference. You know, Unlocking Glory Conference is designed to train up an army of strong leaders to equip the body of Christ in these end times. Through prophetic preaching and teaching, you're going to gain revelation and insight that you need to align yourself up with God's heart to fully step into your calling. You know, God has released a sound of revival, and those that are pressing into him are hearing a new sound. And as we come together in unity and release the sound, we believe that the wells of revival are going to break forth in Tampa Bay. Come on. You know, God has anointed High Tower Ministries with a breaker anointing. So if you want the glory of God to be unlocked into your life, if you want the supernatural and the spiritual activation in your life, you want to be at this conference. Amen. If you're hungry for God and you're eager to hear the Lord on a higher level, if you no longer are satisfied with the occasional encounter with God, but you want to live under an open heaven experience with the Lord, you want his abiding presence with you. Mm -hmm. If you're eager to move in the supernatural gifts of his spirit and that abundant life that Jesus paid for you to walk in, then this conference is the key that will unlock that door for you. We're going to be covering things in this conference that you don't hear anywhere else. We're going to we're going to share how the Lord speaks through your your spiritual senses. We're going to teach on the inner witness. We're going to uh, teach on the anointing and how God couples the gifts together, how he flows through us by his spirit. Amen. There's been so much that's going to be caught and taught in this conference. So this is one that you will not want to miss. So go to HightowerMinistry.org. Get registered, 
And also your pastor has all the information that you need so that you can get registered. We're going to be looking for you. We're excited to come down and spend time with you and imparting to you what God has for you in this season. Amen. Amen. So go to www.hightowerministry.org and get registered. As you know, seating is limited and we are advertising all over Florida. We have two ways that you can register. So go to our website again at www.hightowerministry.org. And we look forward to seeing you there. All right. Amen. We are so expected. I'm expecting to be refreshed. I'm expecting to be renewed. I'm expecting to go deeper in the things of God. I'm expecting new things to see, new things that I haven't seen before and have refreshed revelation that God's given in the past. You know, uh, somebody can say something that you know, but say it perhaps in a different way under the anointing, and it causes you to know it, causes you to see it, causes it to come alive on the inside. It might be something that you've known your whole life, and you hear it a little bit of a different way, and it captures you, and it renews it just like it's the very first time you've ever heard it before. Amen? Amen. I remember the times that this has happened where it's, you know, the wisdom of God, it, it, it's so profound, but it's so simple at the same time. The book of James talks about easy to be entreated wisdom, where it's something that's so profound, but it's ministered in such a simple way that it's like you should have known it all the time. It's like you have known it all the time. And it's something that's just unlocked on the inside of you. It's not by uh, chance that this is called unlocking glory, hallelujah. And I'm expected a greater level of glory, a greater level of anointing, a greater level of outpouring to take place. I, I just got to say, uh, Brother Wayne, Monday night, I heard you pray with more authority. Yeah, I always hear you pray with the love of God and ministering and a love of people. But I heard you pray with more authority than I've ever heard. I mean, I thought I heard the slap of the head when you put your hand on the leech's head the other day. Like, oh, hallelujah, Brother Wayne's going to get it. <laughs> it, it so, I, and I'm expecting those type of things. Dreams to be dreamed, manifestations of the glory, people to be moving in the gifts in a, in a greater way, in a new way that they haven't moved before. So don't miss this weekend. It's going to be powerful. Um, Friday night, 7 o'clock, Saturday night, 7 o'clock, Saturday morning at 930, and then our regular Sunday morning service. Uh, it's going to be a powerful time. I, I, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Amen. Can you tell? <laughs> let's, let's go ahead and receive our, our tithes and offerings for tonight. If you need an offering envelope, slip up your hand. Uh, you can give online, rockchurchtampabay.org. You can give via the mail. Those that are watching, do we ever get the uh, live stream working? Okay, good, good. Those of you that watch online, you can give via the mail. You can give via online. Those of you that are here, there's no need to give via online because you're already, or uh, via the mail because you're already here, but you can give online. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's get ready to give. Lord God, all things, <clears throat> excuse me, Lord God, all things work together for good to those that love God and those are called according to his purpose. Lord God, we thank you that the things of your word, the things of your spirit, the things that you have called us together, the, the, the uh, uh, association, the divine connection, that those things are working together for our good in our life. And as we sow this seed, hallelujah, we sow it for good, that it work together with uh, the love of God on, that's on the inside of our house, the honor of God that's on, on the inside of our hearts, uh, that the righteousness of God, our heart for the things of God, our heart to bless people, that those things are all working together tonight for good. And God, we bless you for it. We thank you for this seed that we're getting ready to sow. It is going into good ground. It is going into the work of ministry. And it is producing fruit, it is producing harvest, and we bless you and we thank you for it, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's bring our tithes and offerings, praise God.
And turn with me to the book of Amos. Old Testament, I'll give you a little extra moment or two to find it. Amos isn't usually one of those books that people turn into that's just rolling off of the book of Amos chapter 9. Amos is right before Obadiah, but it's kind of hard to find Obadiah too because it's only one chapter. <laughs> I think it goes the book of Daniel, then Hosea, Joel, then Amos. If you made it there, shout amen. Amen, all right. Book of Amos chapter 9, and let's pick up in verse 13 here, amen. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that sows seed, and the mountains will drop sweet wine. Number of the modern translations say new wine. The mountains will drop sweet wine or new wine, and the hills will melt or flow. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they will build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they will plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. And they will also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land. And they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord your God. Oh, hallelujah. Let's look at verse 13 again. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes will overtake, the implication is will also overtake, him that sows seed, and the mountains will drop sweet wine or new wine, and all the hills will melt or also flow with the new wine. Now, of course, when the word's talking about sweet wine and new wine, what is it talking about? The Holy Spirit. We know from Acts chapter 2 that all those people, they thought they had drunk some new wine. And Peter had to say, no, no, no. So at 9 o'clock in the morning, we aren't having that new wine, but we have the new wine of the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the believers were all 120 up on the upper room on one accord, hallelujah, and suddenly the Spirit of God came and, and filled that place like a rushing mighty wind. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. And it came, became that they all overflowed out of that upper room and everybody that was all around there thought that they had drunk what? The new wine. But it wasn't that, and Peter preached the gospel to them, and uh, of course all the 120 that they're um, speaking in tongues and prophesying and declaring the wonderful works of God, Acts chapter 2 says, and then 3,000 people came into the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that day. They were all speaking in tongues. Everybody was wondering what was going on. If it had just been, it was speaking in tongues day, that would have been enough. But oh hallelujah, as a result of the Holy Spirit being poured out, there was thousands of people that got swept into the kingdom of God. Then they went and had a 3,000 person baptism service after that. They took them straight away out to the water to have them be baptized in water. Uh, hallelujah. There's the flow of the new wine and a harvest that goes along with it. A spiritual harvest, a soul harvest. And that's what this verse is also talking about. That the mountains will drop sweet wine, or like I said, a number of the modern translations say new wine. This is talking about a flow and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. A sizable, when I think about it flowing down the mountains, I'm thinking about waterfalls. 
I'm thinking about avalanches. I'm thinking about momentum, a, a, a move of the Holy Spirit that comes with a big momentum with it. And then there's also these phrases in the first part of the verse that's talking about the plowman overtaking the reaper and the treader of grapes overtaking the person that's sowing seed. What this is talking about is an acceleration of time. This is talking about God compacting time into the realm of the suddenly, compacting time into right now. And of course, where it's talking about the plowman and the reaper and the treading of grapes and uh, sowing seed, it's talking about the process of seed time and harvest, right? Now, one of the ways I've always heard this said over the years, and one of the ways we know that this is in the natural, there's seed, and then there's time, and then there's harvest. And what God is talking about in this verse is that element of time being removed. So it's seed, harvest, seed, harvest, seed, harvest that's happening without this long element of time in between. God is accelerating time. And what it's saying, that the plowman will overtake the reaper. What this is saying is that there's somebody in the field and they're, you know, they've got their sickle and they're reaping in the harvest and all of a sudden they hear this uh, uh, behind them and there's somebody behind them in a big old tractor with a plow behind it and said, you need to hurry up and get that harvest in because I've got it. I'm, I'm getting ready to plant some more seed right behind it because there's another harvest that's getting ready to come up. Are you with me? He said, uh, hurry up and get this harvest. It's, it's also talking about a harvest that's so big that the harvest lasts until the next seed time sowing season. Oh, I'll say it like that. So that the plowman is overtaking the reaper. They're reaping in, and it's already time to sow some more seed for the next harvest. And then this other phrase, the treader of grapes, and the implication is will overtake him that sows seed. Now, usually when we think of crops being sown, we think about it in terms of months. Corn and wheat and strawberries and those type of things, those are seasonal harvests. Watermelons, on and on. I'm thinking of uh, things here in Florida that are even, you plant corn and about 90 days later it grows up. You plant wheat and it, some months later it's going to grow up. With grapes, it's talking about not grape vines growing up, it's saying grape seeds growing up. And, and, and this really stood out to me in this verse as I was studying, and I, I didn't ever think about this before, but for a grape vine to grow up from a seed to a vine to producing a fruit of grapes, it can be a process that takes years. That it can take two, three, four, five years or longer even for some grape vines to actually go from seed to grow up and actually produce viable fruit. But what it's saying here is that the treader of grapes is going to come as soon as they're planting the grape seed that the harvest is coming in right behind it. So as the planter's going in, planting his little seed in the ground and turns around and the next thing you know, there's a whole vineyard behind them where they just planted the seed. Now, you know, of course, down here in Florida, we, we don't have a whole lot of uh, 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 vineyards. What we do have is something that's comparable as far as that element of time, oranges. Oranges to go from seed to grow up to orange tree and produce a harvest, that is a process that takes years. My uncle used to manage a... 1,500 acre uh, uh, orange grove 
down in Punta Gorda. And uh, he was there on the front end, and they were planting little bitty orange trees this big. And I remember asking him, I was in, I don't know, fifth, sixth grade, I guess it was, and uh, maybe a little bit older, and uh, asked him, well, how, when is, how, how long until oranges go? It was three years. before. So they planted 1,500 acres of orange trees, and they had to manage them for three years before there was an expectation of a harvest coming out. But what this is saying is that that three years is being taken out, and it's plant and get a harvest. I mean, imagine you have some, you know, a little spot in your backyard that you're going to uh, plant, you know, half a dozen orange trees back there. And you got your little gardening gloves on, and you got a handful of seeds that you're getting ready to plant, and you go out there with your little hand shovel and dig a little hole and take one of those seeds out, put it in the hole and pat it down, and you walk a few feet to go plant the next one, and somebody taps you on the shoulder and says, here, drink this. <laughs> And you will look at it, and this this tall, cold glass of fresh squeezed orange juice, and you go, okay, and you have a sip, and it's the best orange juice you've ever had in your life, and you go, wow, that's good. Where'd you get this anyway? And the person that gave it to you said, look, and it's the seed that you just planted. You you go to the next planting part, and you turn around, and there's a 20 foot orange tree that's already grown up that the the branches are hanging low, full of oranges, and you just planted the seed right before that. That's what this verse is talking about. Something that in the natural is impossible, but not with God. And it's not, if God did that with a little strawberry plant, that you just plant a strawberry seed, and go down the row and turn around, and that strawberry plant that's this big grew up and had 10 strawberries on it or whatever they grow, that would be a miracle. But it's not even just the element of months that God takes out. It's the element of years. I will restore to you the years that the canker worm has eaten away. This is talking, there's so much that it's talking about in this, that one of the parts of it with restoration is that God will restore that element of time like it never even existed, hallelujah. People that have been away from the Lord and gone off over into drugs and gone off. I'm thinking of, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of somebody right now, um, uh, Jim Rhoda's granddaughter, Alyssa, that was here for Chili Cook-Off earlier this year. That Her and her husband, they, they have a wonderful testimony. They got off into drugs and they got off into this and they got off into that. They're such a wonderful couple for the, for the things of God now. God restored them back to wear that time away from the things that God didn't even exist. He took those years out and gave them what they would have had had those years never even existed. And what this is talking about is us believing God in a greater way. Our faith growing and developing in a stronger way. To whereas, let me say it like this. We as believers, we as New Testament, spirit-filled, word-believing, healing-believing, tongue-talking, all those things, believers, we can find ourselves establishing doctrines in our life without even realizing it, even based on our victories. Based on the, I mean, hallelujah, spirit-filled, faith, word people that have seen God move in our life many, many, many times, we can even be, begin to build doctrines in our life based on how we've seen God move up until this point. That, for, for example, you can have somebody that, you know, I'm just thinking of a, a financial example. You can have somebody that God has moved in their life to meet their financial needs countless times over the years. But the way they've seen God move on their behalf is always somehow, some way through the work of their hands. Are you with me? That God will give them overtime. 
that God will give them a side job, that God will, you know, have where their neighbors shows up and say, you know, I got all this stuff I need to do, blah, 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 blah. I could use some help. And, and they just go over and help them, and they get paid a bunch. That it's always through the work of their hands, and they've never experienced a Pentecostal handshake before. That they've never experienced a check in the mail. They've never experienced somebody come on up to them and saying, I don't know who you are, but I've seen you across this restaurant and God has been t- talking to me this whole time we've been sitting here eating to write you a check for $5,000. You know, you n- they don't never experienced something like that. And because they've never experienced it like that before, we can build a doctrine around that and say, well, God doesn't move that way for me. But the reality of it should be, according to faith, that I might not have seen God move like that ever in my life up until this point. But what God wants to do is cause our faith to grow, cause us to see him in a, in a greater way where that element of time goes out of, well, I'm going to have to work and I'm going to have to wait for a paycheck and I'm going to have to do this and I'm going to have to do that. And it compresses that time down to suddenly right now. Or, or like a, a soul winning, the same example in a different way, a soul winning. You, you can, I mean, there's some soul winners right here on the front row, hallelujah, praying, praying everybody they know into the kingdom of God. And you can have somebody that they've had success after success after success of winning people to the Lord, but what they've seen all the way until this point is it taking a long time. Does anybody know? Yes. <laughs> oh, man, you're praying for him, and you're witnessing to him when God opens the door for you. And then you notice over the course of time that, God, uh, uh, that God's been moving on their heart, and they're a little bit more receptive to the witnessing. And then they go through this thing, and they go through that thing, and then finally their whole life's falling apart, and they come into the kingdom of God, finally. And hallelujah, praise God for those type of things when it happens like that. But... The next person, the next family member you find out went off into sin, went off into some crazy, you know, immorality like there is in the world these days or whatever it is, and you're going, oh, man, i got a fight on my hands. But the, we believe at a higher level where you pray today and you get the phone call before you go to sleep tonight, oh, hallelujah, I've repented and gave my life back to God. Where it's the same result, but time's been t- taken out of the mix, and it's gone over into right now, hallelujah. We're standing in this right now. With the massive renovation project that went on earlier this year, that we, and I, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, you guys lived it just with me, that we moved into the building and, you know, got things set up, and then uh, last, before COVID, we got all the, it was so interesting, we bought all the chairs that match, and then immediately we couldn't sit in them because everything had been closed for, for a while. We got the chairs, and then at the beginning of the year, we got the lighting for up here. Then a couple months later, we, we, we got the, uh, um, we, we raised the money and painted the sanctuary, and the Lord, the Lord was in it. God gave us the timing. God gave us the wisdom of what to do, and, you know, raising the money, and People came together and the money came in. God moved on people's heart and the money came in and we did it. And it was this time of year that my plan was to do the kitchen. That was my next thing. When when we finished the painting of the sanctuary, that was what was on my heart, to get that curtain (laughs) for the hidden kitchen up there and and get a a nice kitchen that we wouldn't have to hide behind a curtain. But God said, no, no, no. And and we're thinking about doing this and we're thinking about doing that. I'm thinking, man, unless we're just going to keep doing this back to back to back and you know, really putting the focus on that and really asking a lot of people, this is something that's going to take years to finish up. But what did God do? Okay, here you go. Here's all of it. Where instead of it being two or three years to be able to get some of those things done, it was two or three weeks, and it was all done, and it was all paid for. God took the element of time out of the equation. I mean, it did seem like years staying up those 18-hour days when we were doing it, (laughs) God took that element of time and what could have taken taken two or three years got accomplished in two or three weeks, hallelujah. It's going to a higher place, going to a higher level. I'm thinking about the woman with the issue of blood. 
and let me just go back to this for a second. What we're talking about, is, the title of this message is Growing Faith. Growing Faith. That we believed on this level and have seen God move in miraculous ways. But it's continuing to grow that we're believing for bigger. But also what this scripture is talking about is believing for now. Believing for suddenly. Not according to our experiences, not basing our experiences, not, not basing our faith and our expectation on our experiences, but basing it on the word of God. Not what we've seen before, not what God has done until this point. Because in that, in that way, we can actually limit God. The, according to our faith, are we made whole? Let me just remind you that Jesus went into his hometown. He could do no mighty works there because they didn't believe. The woman with the issue of blood, she heard about Jesus. And here she was saying, if I can just go get a hold of the hem of his garment, I'll be made completely whole. And in that statement, she's saying, I don't need to sit and wait through a meeting that Jesus has. I don't need to wait for him to do an altar call. I don't need to wait for him to have a healing line. I don't even have to wait for him to look at me. He can be going the other direction. But if I can just get a hold of Jesus. She said, I'm not waiting for him to call me. I'm going to get a hold of him. In the face of 12 years of letdowns that she had. Remember, she had spent all that she had on every possible method to get healed. But when she got hold of the ministry of Jesus, she believed on another level than she had ever believed before. Hallelujah. Go with me over to uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. We've been, we talked about this scripture as part of the series we just finished up, finished up on honoring the call of God on your life. But I want to touch on this again. Verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet or as it is proper, because that your faith is doing what? Growing exceedingly, and the love of every one of you toward one toward each other abounds. But what I wanted to center up on is faith growing exceedingly. Every person in this sanctuary tonight, I, I know you've got miracle results in your life. I, I can start calling people out. Miracle results, miracle healing, miracle marriage, miracle overcoming adversity, miracle having a call on your life, being used of the things of God, that we have had faith. And we have gotten, I mean, not just little results either. Amen? Amen. Brother Wayne, kidney things, you know, I mean, on and on and on and on. Over, overcoming, you know, Marie and Danelle with uh, not sure where they were going to live. There's miracle place where they're going to live again and again and again. God blessing them again and again and again. They're going all around the room. We could see where, I mean, Abigail and Ethan, they're, they're more financially blessed as, as little kids. I mean, than anybody I know, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, man, I mean, a miracle. I mean, they got $50 bills in the mail just this week. I'm like, they're coming, in, that's my $50 bill. <laughs> the, but here's what I want to say. I want to have faith that's growing. Hallelujah for the miracle that God did. Three years ago, ten years ago. Hallelujah for the miracle God is doing now. 
but I want to have it where people come back to Rock Church in Tampa Bay. The, the, the Nordines are coming here this weekend. And whatever the next time they came down here to, to minister, that they go, man, this church, their faith in this grow, church has grown exceedingly from the last time that I was here. They were getting results before. We were doing outreaches before. We were seeing salvations before. We were seeing people get healed and, and delivered before. But from then to now, there is an exceeding level of growth that has taken place. I, I'm, I don't want to be stagnant. I don't want to be Settling. I love a good testimony. I love to tell my testimonies. I love to hear other people's testimonies, whether it's from this week or five years ago or ten years ago, whatever it is. Thank God for those. But I want some more. I'm not going to settle just for what God. Thank God for all the things God did. But I'm not just going to rest and hang out now because I got some good testimonies on what God's done in my life. I want to have some growth. So that whatever the top thing that I'm believing for, now whatever is just like the, the, the thing where it's, I mean, you can have stuff where the, the impossible thing to you is an everyday faith party. You know, for, you know what I'm talking about? You can have something that's, you know, you're, you're believing for, you know. I mean, I'm thinking about that thing where that young lady uh, came in here on a Wednesday night at the old building. And uh, um, she had cervical cancer. And she came to after the service and uh, to Pastor Brian, and, and uh, she asked for prayer. And, and Pastor Brian chuckled. <laughs> she, he, he chuckled. And she's like, well, I don't think that's very funny. Well, well that was that, that season where we had cancer healing after cancer healing after cancer healing. And, I mean, this, this young lady, or, or Lauren, I think was her name. Lauren was her name. And... Uh, she went and got documented proof next time she went to the doctor that the cervical cancer was totally gone. That it was, it was something that was impossible to her, but Pastor Brian had a chuckle for it, and the next thing you know, she was able to believe on a higher level because of the manifestation that took place. That There's that scripture, and now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. God will do things above the level that we would even dare to ask, above the level that we even think he can do. But once we see him do it, there's a precedent set where now we can think it. Now, now we can have a hope and an expectation for it. And now we can ask for it. We would dare to ask for it because we've seen in his word that he would do it or we've seen the manifestation of it. That our faith is growing exceedingly. And again, growing in magnitude and then also growing in the element of time. Like, and, and, and I'm not just saying, believe a God will do everything suddenly. Let me say it like this. Believing God past the level of your experience, past the level of how he's done it for you before, believe on the level according to his word rather than on the level according to what we've seen last time. Because our experience shouldn't be the governor. Like, a, like on a carburetor, that kind of, go, not the governor of the state of Florida, but there's the governor, there's that, there's that throttle lever, and there's the little screw that's a stopper. That when you, when the, you hit the throttle, the, 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 when you hit the gas, that throttle goes up and it hits that screw, and that's the fast point. But what you can do is loosen out that screw so, <laughs> so you can get more power out of the throat, there's that's the governor. You can have something like the stopping point, the the a gate that's a stopping point, and the gate for our stopping point can be our experience. 
some kind of limiting factor that's in the way. What God will do for us, what God will do, you know, for somebody that's not some big time minister, what God will do for, you know, somebody that's not in the Old Testament, what God will do if Jesus isn't physically standing here with us. So we can have all these limiting factors that are limited based on what we think rather than by the word of God. Hallelujah. Go with me over to uh, Luke chapter 5. Do you remember, before I read this, do you remember um, when Elijah came in and spoke to the king during that famine? Actually, it wasn't a famine. It was a siege. Uh, the tribe of Judah was under siege. And uh, remember, they were eating donkey head soup and bird poop and, all, you know, they were eating all kinds of stuff and paying big money for this food that nobody would want to eat. And then Elijah went in, and I believe it's 2 Kings chapter 7, he went in and uh, he told the, the, the king, thus saith the Lord, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be having uh, fine flour for a penny or for a shekel, and you're going to have barley also for a shekel. And there was one of the king's uh, ministers that were standing there, and um, he goes, really? What? Even if God opened the windows of heaven, would this thing even happen? And Elijah turned right back around and goes, yes, it will happen. But you're going to get to see it, but you're not going to get to taste it. Now, that, that man could have said, oh, hallelujah. Because, let me, let me back up in this. There was no fine flour to be had in the, in the city for any money, much less for a penny or a shekel or whatever that denomination of money was. And he said, by this time tomorrow, there's going to be an abundance where there's gonna, the, the, the supermarkets are going to be full, your belly's going to be full, and they'd been in this impossible situation. And the person didn't believe because that level of time got past his choke point. <laughs> he goes, oh, hallelujah, by this time next year, that God could maybe believe, oh, yeah, but God will turn this situation around slowly but surely. But the man of God came in and prophesied by this time tomorrow. And that guy didn't believe. And he did get to see it. I remember what happened to that guy that uh, uh, he was standing watching the gate of the city. And when everybody found out that they could go get flour and they could go get food and the siege was over, he got trampled at the gate. He got to see it. But he never did get any fine flour for a penny. He never did get a bite of bread. He didn't believe, so he didn't partake. That which God has done before in Rock Church of Tampa Bay, I'm thankful for. It's been wonderful. But I'm believing for more. I'm believing that one service one Wednesday night service, we come in, and things are a little bit sparse, but the next Wednesday night service, we turn around and look, and where'd all these people come from? Because we can have an expectation that God will bring in one family, and God will bring in one person, and God will bring in one couple, and then there'll be this, and then there'll be that, based on what has happened in the past, but what God can do is beyond that which we have seen before, and the next thing we know, we turn around, and this place is full. Not just full of people, full of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Hallelujah. I don't want to be that person that we get the, the prophetic word comes forth and we're going, yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, the, the, I know that that's what you say, but you don't know how things work around here. You don't know how things have been because of COVID. You don't know how things have been because we're in a storefront. You don't know how things because of this or in our own life. Well, you know, that, you know, we believe in God, and, but you don't know how long I've had this condition. You don't know my situation. You don't know what the doctor said. That we can believe out beyond the, the like my, you know, the yeah, buts. <laughs> the yeah, but, yeah, but. You know, a lot of times when you hear that yeah, but you're getting ready to hear a whole lot of unbelief. Amen. Let's talk about this element of time in uh, Luke chapter 5. Verse 1. It says, and it came to pass that the people pressed upon him, talking about Jesus, that as the people uh, pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, 
But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now let's stop right here for a second. Jesus is trying to preach to these people. But in the midst of him trying to minister, all these people are jostling around for position, trying to get close to him. They're uh, uh, trying to touch him. They're trying to get his attention. And Jesus can't preach this message. Not only can he not effectively preach the message in that thing, but nobody's effectively listening because everybody's just elbow in to try to get close to Jesus. And about the time they get close to Jesus and they're looking like this, somebody else comes in and mm, elbows them out of the way. So he's having a hard time keeping the people's attention during this word. Their attention was divided. So Jesus is led to where Peter was. And he asked Peter, hey, uh, sir, do you mind if I get in your boat and we just kind of push out a little bit from the shore so I can preach this message to these people? And, and to me, this looks sounds like just a beautiful scene. Here's Jesus, and he's in Peter's fishing boat, and he's pushed out just far enough from shore where people can't, get to him but people can still hear what he says and instead of all these people all jostling around him now everybody's lined up just on the shoreline right there you've got the water uh, just kind of lapping up on the shores right there and now Jesus is able to preach his message right and then Jesus finishes his message in the next verse here verse 4 now when he had left speaking he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drop or for a, dra a, a great catch of fish. This is Jesus saying to Peter, so let, let me say it like this. Jesus preaches this message, finishes preaching this message, and he turns to Peter and says, let's go get your harvest. Because remember, that why, why would I say harvest here? When Peter gave Jesus the use of his boat for that message, that boat became a tool of ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That boat was a blessing to Jesus. Remember, blessing means empowerment to prosper. It was an empowerment and an enablement for him to effectively be able to preach that message. And in turn, that boat was a blessing for him so the word could go out and bless those people that were there. Jesus was blessed. And the way Jesus received that blessing, whether Peter realized it or not when he first let, let Jesus the use of the boat, Jesus received that as a seed that was sown into his ministry. And Jesus turns it around to Peter and says, it's harvest time right now. I, I'm thinking about it with People say about us with the block party. Oh, yeah, what'd you do this weekend? And Oh, yeah, we did this outreach, or we did backpacks, or we gave out, you know, 600 bags of food, or whatever it is. And you have some people go, oh, what a, what a powerful outreach. What a blessing of the Lord to be able to do that. And then you have some people, I don't know if you guys have had this happen, where you're talking to somebody, and, you know, they know the things of God a little bit, but they might not really be that saved. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they, they want to say something spiritual, but it's uncomfortable for them. So they say, oh, oh, yeah, you, I, I know when you do stuff like that, you get a couple of extra points with the man upstairs. You know what I'm talking about? You know, people talk like that <laughs> a little bit. Oh, yeah, you get some extra points when you do stuff like that for the man upstairs. 
And the implication is somewhere down the road, God's going to get you back. Somewhere down the road, God's going to bless you. When you, when you get to heaven, there's going to be some extra reward for the thing that, that you did down here on the earth. And that's true. But what Jesus did was take out the element of time and turned around to Peter and said, let's go get your harvest right now. And let's look at the next verse. I think it's verse 5 or 6. And Simon answered to him, Master, we have toiled all the night. We have been fishing all night long, and we have caught nothing. We have zero fishes to, to we worked all night long. How many fish, how many uh, dollars an hour did you make? Zero. And then Peter said this one word, nevertheless. Nevertheless is a fancy way of saying but. And when he said nevertheless, Peter made a decision to override all the experience that he had known as a fisherman his whole life and give authority to Jesus in his life. Nevertheless, at your what? Word. At that moment. Peter, he, I, I was just talking to a friend of mine the other day, and uh he had, he had went fishing with a friend, he and his son, um, uh, actually, actually it was Pastor Mike Masters, that he had went fishing with his son, with a friend of his that he knew from high school, and he sent me these pictures, and they hauled in these beautiful red, I mean, they were huge redfish, and I, I've seen, uh, you know, he sent me some pictures of him going fishing before, and they got some little, you know, river fish that are like some little guppies, maybe you'll get one, you know, three-incher, but they're, they're some little small, these ones, they had them all lined up on the docks, and it's like, Boom, 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 big, fat fish. And uh, I said, where'd you go? I said, did you, ran a, did you go with a captain? He goes, well, kind of. He ran into a friend of his that he knew from high school or something like that. And uh, turned out this guy has a boat. And turned out this guy, he, he knows every fishing spot around this place. I guess he's got a place where the, he can just drop the boat in. And he knew all the fishing spots where to go. So they didn't even have to do that much work. They just throwing the and pulling in whoppers. And uh, <laughs> that was how Peter was on that lake. Peter knew that lake like the back of his hand. His family business was fishing. And here's this preacher man going, hey, hey, let's go get your harvest. Peter knew it wasn't fish catching time. He had just got in from fishing all night. And he, he went to every one of his spots that he knew. He used every trick of the trade that he knew. He used his best, he, you know, he, he used his, his, his lucky fish eye that he had. And, you, you know, you throw it with your left hand and you catch it with your right hand. And every, every good luck trick he knew to do, every uh, fishing spot he knew to do, and came home with a big old goose egg. And according to that which he had known, he could have just said, I've been fishing all night and haven't caught anything, and it's time for me to go to bed. I, I'm glad you got to use the boat. I'm glad I was here. See you, preacher man. And he would have been just another guy. But he said that word, nevertheless. He's saying, Jesus, all my experience is telling me this other way. All my experience says this is the way this situation is going to turn out. Nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to act on it. I'm going to follow you anyway. I'm going to believe further than I've ever believed before anyway. And when he did that, his life changed forever. His life changed forever. That he believed on a level that he had never believed before. He began to see results that he never believed before. And you know what happened ha Happened next, that the net broke, and he had to call his uh, fishing partners to come and get their boat, and they filled both boats up. And then at the end, Jesus said, uh, 
up at this point, you've just been fishers of fishes, but from this point on, you're going to be fishers of men. Hallelujah. It opened the door for a whole new realm because he believed on a, never, on a level that he had never believed before, because he submitted be, on, to a level that he had never believed before, because he said yes on a never, level that he had never believed before. God, he opened up the door for Jesus to take out that element of time based on the time of day, based on the time of year, based on all the things that were going against, based on time. It's not fishing time. It's daytime. I've been fishing all night, so it must be whatever he was fishing was nocturnal fish, if that's a thing. <laughs> whatever it was, time didn't line up in the natural based on his experience. But what Jesus did is come pack that time and say, come get your harvest right now. Hallelujah. Go with me over to Hebrews chapter 4. Believing on a level that we've never believed before. Seeing results to a magnitude, to a degree than we've never seen before. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1. Actually, what it's talking about in this passage of Scripture, if we could... We could read all the way back up, you know, deep into chapter 3. But what Jesus is, or excuse me, the writer of the book of Hebrews is talking about is referred to as the provocation, where uh, the children of Israel, they got right up there getting ready to go in the promised land. They uh, uh, rebelled. You know, the spies came back and talked about big giants and big walled cities, and everybody got afraid, and everybody wanted to commit mutiny against Moses and Aaron and God and make them a new leader and go back and be slaves again. And they had said that, I believe it was ten times that they said that to the Lord, and it provoked God and said, no, 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 you say that you, you're going to die out in the wilderness? Okay, you're going to have what you say, and you're going to go around in the wilderness for the next 40 years until all of you are gone. That's what it's, it's talking about in these previous verses. Verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 4, it says, Let us, fear, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. We could also talk about this in the, in the context of what he's talking about in chapter 3, which is such a powerful thing. We don't have time to get into all that, but let's say it like this. As in promise being left to us, or a promise being ministered to us through the word of God, for entering into the promised land. Isn't that what the, the children of Israel were believing for? Isn't that what they were going for was entering into the rest of the promised land? Lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come shortened. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. In order for the word to be profitable to us, we are, big surprise, we have to mix it with faith. We have to believe. And there can be a promise that's released, but we can mix it with one level of faith and get one level of results, or we can mix it with another level of faith and get a completely greater level of results, even in a church service. You can have a person that is coming in, believe in God with all their heart, hallelujah, and with an expectation for God to move, and I'm going to bring this sacrifice of praise, and I'm going to worship God with all my heart, and I'm, I'm just expecting God to move, and God does for them. And you can have the same person right next to them going, bless me if you can. You know, that, that, that worship song, boy, I just, I don't know, uh, that, it's just they sang it too high today. 
that's just the key they sing. And I just can't sing that high, you know. And, and the, you know, the, the lighting up front, I didn't, I didn't really care for that lighting. And then I walk in and, oh, there's some visitor sitting in my seat. And, oh, man, I just can't worship when I'm not sitting in my spot. <laughs> and totally miss out on a move of God because it wasn't this way. It can happen with a, a church service. It can happen with the things of God. It can happen a, across the full spectrum of life. That we have a promise, but we come short of the promise because we aren't we aren't adding the active ingredient. There's there's a welding compound. Some of you might know know called JB Weld, and you got two ingredients, and you you take both of those ingredients and you mix them together, and they become a very uh, uh, they come, it's, a, it's kind of a thick liquid, but it becomes like a welding agent because one ingredient activates the other ingredient. Just like with, with uh, yeast, you put in that activating ingredient and it causes the whole thing to rise. It's like that with faith. We put in that activating ingredient and it causes the whole thing to rise. Last uh, scripture, go all the way down to verse uh, 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall short after the same example of unbelief. And I want to leave you with this today. Don't be prematurely satisfied. Don't be satisfied with one harvest, with one answered prayer. Hallelujah, be thankful. But don't quit after that prayer is answered. You, you see it in the things of God. That people, they, they get the house, they get the relationship, they get the position, they get the thing that they've been going after, and they check out after that because they got satisfied. That they, they go and they... You know, I, I got to go do this thing that I've always wanted to do. I got to reach to this certain position, and now I made it. And God wasn't done with them yet. That was just the springboard to get to the next level of God, what God was really wanting to do in their life. That people can just get, actually, let me say this. People can get satisfied with one harvest prematurely, and people can get started. Satisfied with one seed prematurely. People come, I, I just want a word. We bring in Brother Phil or somebody in this place will fill up because people want a word. And then the next week they don't come back because they were satisfied in the seed, but they didn't press in enough for the heart. They didn't believe to. And that's why the word is talking about let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Is it laboring for one promise to be fulfilled? Laboring for the next promise to be fulfilled? Laboring in that next word that's been sown in your heart? Say, oh, Lord God, I thank you for that for harvest. I thank you for that blessing. And I thank you for this next seed that's been sown in my life. And I'm believing for that harvest. And I'm standing for that. And I'm pressing in for that. And that which was impossible for me yesterday, I'm standing on top of the reality of that harvest today. And there's a new impossible uh, thing that's out in front of me. This weekend is a weekend that we labor to enter in with a greater level of growing faith than we did before. That we have an expectation for growing faith. That the... The eyes of our perspective, the eyes of our understanding, that they're going out further beyond the horizon of that which we did last time. That which we did last service. That's what we did last year. That which you did for the last victory in your life. That we just don't go, oh, yeah, I got that victory. I'm good now. That we're getting, we're laboring, not, not of toil, not of the sweat of our brow, but in faith, because faith without works is dead. Hallelujah. That we're putting forth a greater degree of adherence to the word of God, adherence to the things of God, 
believing for an additional sensitivity to the voice of the Spirit of God so that we can be prepared into uh, propelled into a, a greater manifest manifestation of the things of God in our life. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Lord God, we thank you that you're the God of suddenly. God, we thank you that you are the author of the now kind of faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right now, hallelujah. Jesus, you are the alpha and the omega. You are the beginning and the end. You are the author and the finisher and the perfecter of our faith. And Lord God, we ask you, Lord, Lord God, we can't ask you to just grow our faith. Jesus, the disciples said, Jesus, increase our faith, and he said, sow it as a seed. Lord God, we thank you for the seed of the word of God. And faith coming by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Lord God, we want to see greater faith in our lives. So in order to experience that, we need to have a, 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 a greater focus, tunnel vision, setting our eyes like flint on the word of God so that we have a greater faith for greater manifestations of your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you.